Good evening. Uh, my name is Charlene Garcia Sims. I'm the Genealogy and Special Collections Librarian here at Rawlings. And tonight we have part two of uh, Eduardo Grego Gonzalez's uh, presentation on the on on the Mayan uh, culture, and he'll explain a little bit more, um, uh, give you a little bit more of a synopsis. Eduardo is a 30-year student of the uh, of the Ki She Maya. Um, Eduardo is a 30-year student of the Ki She Maya science. He initiated as a counter of the days, Ah Kish, and El Camino del Fuego of the Kiiche Maya in 2001 after walking the water path the year before. Eduardo's novel, Yashel, The Giver, contains much of what he learned over the years in the sacred teachings of the Maya and other indigenous elders and how we can apply these teachings to our present day lives. So welcome, Eduardo. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. Sorry I messed up this, uh, the, the pronunciations. I'm going to work really hard on that. Okay, I, 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 it took me a while to get it to. It took me a, probably a, a month before I could understand and, and pronounce some of the Mayan words, but it's uh, it comes with practice and it's actually a good thing to learn. We're going to learn a little bit about how to pronounce the, the names of the glyphs and the numbers and so forth today. Um, I respect other languages and I really, you know, I really like to work on the pronunciation. So I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you very much. Hello world, um, planetary system that we live in, I should say. I know this is getting broadcasted, uh, broadcasting out to not just human beings, but all beings, because what we're about to talk about are some important things that I feel um, we do need to talk about right now. We're in the time of, of change, and uh, today's presentation is going to be called Ancient Teachings for living on earth in a time of change. And I think we can all agree that right now, since last December, uh, much has happened with uh, in our on our planet, especially in our uh, civilization here, we call the United States of America. And I wanna remind everybody a little bit before we go into what I'm gonna be talking about in part two, I'd kind of like to review uh, some of the things that we talked about last month, uh, last uh, November, uh, we talked a lot about the this changes that have happened in the past in ancient civilizations and how they responded, how people responded to those changes, what happened, what caused the collapse of a of a civilization, let's say a, lo a long term civilization, and then what happened with the people's lives when that when that occurred. The reason why I want to talk about this is I feel like it's very important for us to be aware that as we go through this time of change here in the United States and actually all around the world, uh, we have to recognize that change has always been one of the things that has happened over and over throughout the history of this planet, over the millions of years that human beings have lived on the planet. There was constant changes, uh, earth changes, weather changes, uh, life changes. So here we are. Uh, but before we get started, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, this book here. Uh, this is actually referred to. It's called the Kumatsim Wuh Hun, and it's the uh, Codex of Tikal, and we know it as the Dred Dresden Codex. And uh, you can see Codex of Dresde. It was discovered. Uh, at the end of World War II, when uh, the library in Dresden, Germany, had been bombed and it was burning, uh, the firemen went and and put the fire out. And in doing so, a lot of the uh, beautiful books and things that were there stored there were ruined. And one of this particular book um, survived. And uh, luckily, it was one of the el the oldest printed books that the Maya had created during the time of Tikal. And uh, my teachers in Guatemala uh, used this book to, uh, they referred to it, I should say, over and over in, in the teachings that we will call uh, the teachings of the Codex of Tikal later on as we get into this presentation. Another book that I recently discovered a few years ago, I should say, uh, is the uh, Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch by J.J. Hurtak. 
And uh, we'll be using this information, some of this information in here to talk about this place that we call Tikal that other people have called Zarahemla. And Zarahemla is referred to in other books, including the Book of Mormon, uh, this book, and uh, some other re writings that I have read over the years referring to this area in Mesoamerica that is in the Peten uh, jungle of Guatemala, and, uh, and especially about Tikal. And uh, there's another book. I wish I had a copy of the, the uh, Book of Mormon. I've read it and had it, and I don't know what happened to it. I must have loaned it to someone and never saw it again, which happens. And that re the reason I wanted to talk about that is because we're going to be discussing some things about how the Book of Mormon describes Christ living amongst or visiting the, the people of Tikal uh, after he had resurrected. Um, so it, it gets interesting. Let's say that it gets very interesting as we, as we move forward here. So let's get started. Ancient teachings for living on earth in a time of change, part two. The uh, story that we're about to hear was actually taught to me by my teacher, Jose Coutinho, an Achkich, and his wife, Carla Cufinho, a sacerdotisa, both teachers of the Kiche Maya teachings, and they live in uh, Antigua, Guatemala. And they walked me on the water path called the Camino de Agua and uh, the fire path, the Camino del Fuego. And uh, they were my teachers for three years, over a period of three, to three and a half years, uh, as I walked the path of the water path and the fire path of the Kiiche Maya throughout Guatemala. My other teacher, Eileen Meyer, uh, you'll hear more about her uh, in the future because we're gonna be doing some more talks together. And uh, I wanna thank them as my teachers. I also want to give thanks to the Pueblo City County Library. Um, they've just been fantastic at supporting me, allowing me to have talks there at the, at the Rawlings uh, branch uh, from time to time, but also, also supporting uh, me by offering the, me the ability to do these talks uh, over um, this YouTube channel that they own. I want to also give thanks to the National Geographic magazine for the LIDAR technology photos that they supplied in their magazines and allowed uh, many of the archeologists to see and use to, to really discover um, what was really under the growth of the jungle uh, there in, uh, in this area that we're gonna be discussing today. I also uh, happened upon a, a really beautiful painting that came from uh, the teachings of the Book of Mormon. And also the Meridian Magazine, I wanna give thanks to them for uh, an article that was written about how LIDAR technology allowed them to really see deeper into the jungle growth and discover that, that it was a, a really an, a, a proof source, let's say, for the fact that the Book of Mormon uh, really did have a description of Tikal and where Christ would uh, later appear after he uh, resurrected. Uh, I wanna thank the writers, the Mayan people who wrote the Dresden Codis, we call it, but it's actually the Codis of Tikal because this is where we're gonna get a lot of the information that we're gonna be talking about. And JJ Hertek, I wanna thank for writing the Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, where he actually has maps of the same area called Zarahemla, the same thing that's in the Book of Mormon that was written long time before by Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon was written by Joseph Smith, talking about this area. And I also wanna give thanks to the Urantia Society, Urantia Society uh, for publishing the Urantia book, which I read for many years. And the reason why is that we'll get into a discussion about the kingdom of heaven that, that Jesus teaches about. This uh, living on uh, planet earth during the 13th Baktun, uh, is our first place where we're going to go. And we're going to understand more about the way the Maya counted their days and, and uh, years and so forth. And uh, how that connection of us to our earth 
uh, must take place, that we must reconnect back to earth and forgive the past. And a lot of this is discussed in the Dresden Codice, but let's just call it the Codice of Tikal from now on. The, the teachings of the Chol Kich, which is a Kiche word for another word would be the Tzolkin, a different language. There were 26 to 30 different dialects of Maya spoken throughout Mesoamerica. So you'll hear many different dialects of the, the sacred calendar system. In fact, even the, the glyphs and the tones have different names. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a Mayan prayer that was taught to me from day one when I walked the path. Uh, it was calling the, the heart of the cosmos, the heart of earth, the heart of wind, the heart of water. And it's the key to our own heart. And all of these uh, prayers that my teachers would say at the beginning of the ceremonies was inviting the heart of the cosmos, the heart of earth, the heart of wind, the heart of water to gather together as we went into our sacred ceremonies around the fire and, and uh, sometimes um, around a pit that had been filled with food and offerings of food to Mother Earth called a Pokemon ceremony. We'll get into the heart intelligence of human beings and how to feel empowered when we begin to use that power that we have within us as we get into this conversation about the kingdom of heaven that's within. Uh, the goal, of course, is to now at this time that we're going through this change, what we would call the a world out of balance, at least what the Maya would say is happening, that the world has been out of balance and that it's now entering into a period of time of 26,000 years when we have an opportunity to re-enter back into this time of finding ourselves again and remembering who we are and connecting back to our mother earth uh, and, and remembering the mother and the feminine energy again so that we can prepare ourselves for the changing of our planet. We're moving into the new world uh, uh, and a new way of living. I say new world. I should probably say that it's a new planet and it's got new concepts and new, new ideas that are arriving within our consciousness right now so that we can create a new way to live, to walk on this planet Earth. I'll also get into awakening uh, by letting go of fear and using love, which is the most powerful source of energy in our super universe, using love to shift everything within ourselves and everything within the way that we think and feel so that we can go through the shift that Earth is going to go through. Um, I feel like we're at this situation in, on planet Earth right now where um, the people of the Americas uh, have been expecting this return. It's been talked about in many uh, books and many uh, uh, concepts and ideas that are out there to um, feel like uh, we're aware that all of this um, metamorphosis is occurring on our planet and within us, almost as if we're in the chrysalis now, the chrysalis stage of, of moving from the caterpillar life into the chrysalis stage so that we can exit the chrysalis and become a butterfly that we really are. Uh, we're gonna talk about the kingdom of heaven, where it exists and how we can start connecting to this field, uh, the field that connects all things to all. Uh, in review, uh, this is a photo of the Grand Plaza in Tikal, uh, Guatemala. These beautiful temples that were built um, 2,500 years ago uh, were built on top of other temples, according to my teachers, that go back as, as long as 6,000 years. Um, and this beautiful plaza is where I spent many a fire ceremony in that uh, fire pit that's got the little white around it that um, is in the center and where I initiated my student Eileen uh, when she initiated that's where we did her ceremony and it's just one of the most beautiful places uh, I've ever been in my life hopefully you'll have an opportunity to go there and, and see what I'm talking about okay in review I'd like to talk about uh, what we talked about last time was 
how to call this amazing civilization, this amazing society uh, began to collapse, that everything started to change for them. They're, it, they, the people of this beautiful city, um, this beautiful temple, and it was just, it's more, it can't be called a city. It's got to be called a way of life. A civilization will have to refer to it as that it it was an example that I chose without even knowing all of the details about what we would discover with LIDAR lately and what we've been now talking about as far as it being called Zarahemla. Um, what happened was that it it after a long period of time, 800 years, the city began to collapse. The, the civilization began to collapse. The people's lives began to change. And it was caused by a few things. First, the droughts and the shortages of food. Second, their water source uh, became polluted by a stone they were using called cinnabar. And this stone was used to tint their paint and was used in, on their temples and paintings do um, that was, they were using to paint pretty much everything um, in and around them with a red color that was gathered by grinding up cinnabar, the stone, and creating a tint. And their paint was used on the temples and um, uh, pretty much on everything they did because they loved the color red. However, there was one problem. They didn't realize it at the time, but cinnabar actually contains mercury. And over a period of time, that toxic mercury was getting uh, washed by rain and washing people, washing their clothes and washing their, their bodies uh, in the water. Uh, their water, drinking water, became polluted, and many of them became ill. There was also, in this, at this time of the collapse, just before it collapsed, there began a lot of infighting with the leadership, and it began to divide them into separate groups. And wars upon war upon war started to happen just at the collapse time of Tikal. So after 800 years of peace, prosperity, and growth, these people that were there living there and, and, and really thriving had to leave. Some went off in different directions. Some returned to the jungle. Uh, some went north, some went south in large groups. And we'll talk about that later. But more importantly, uh, they all survived in one way or another by moving out of that area and going where they could drink the water. So in the predictions of the Maya, according to the ancient calendar system, we call the long count. There was a, a time that was predicted in the future of the 13th Bakhtun. This is an example of the counting system, the number system that the Olmec created, and then the Maya and other people that lived in Mesoamerica began to use to keep track of the days and years of, the, of their calendar system. You can see they created zero, uh, one dot was one, a bar was five. Uh, you can see the rest. Uh, notice that when you get to 20, a dot above the, the zero meant that it was 20. So that means that they were using a, a system of tens. They were using a system of 20s. This is a long count system, the grand cycle. And it is uh, the kind of carving that you would see on pretty much all the stele, all the stone carvings that are around the cities there, the, the villages and the temples, and they break it up into uh, Baktun, Katun, Tun, Winal, and Kin or Kich. And a Baktun is 144,000 days. A Katun is 7,200 days. A Tun is 360 days. And the Winal is 20 days. Uh, so you can see their whole counting system was different than what we presently use, but it's very sophisticated and accurate. We've all heard over the years about the end of the long count, which was predicted to be December 21st, 2012. And in essence, what really occurred on that day was that the calendar system went from 12 Baktun, and I could go on and what the total number of, of Tun and Katun and all of that below there, but on, on December 21st, it switched over to Oshlahu Baktun. Oshlahu is 13. So it, it became the 13th Baktun. And on that day, the sacred number is four, or Kayeb. 
and the day of the glyph, the glyph would have been Akpu or Hunakpu. And that's what it looks like. Oshlahu Baktum. Oshlahu means the time of magical power, the time to transform, for transition, transmutation, and when everything is possible. Now, the number 13 carries that information within it. It is secret information that was only found in the Codex of Tikal. So when we talk about the number Oshlahu 13, this is uh, when we do a Mayan horoscope for someone, uh, there's only 13 total numbers that we use in the, in the counting system of the sacred calendar. So we have 13 numbers or tones and 20 glyphs. So we're in this time now that the elders predicted would come. The end of a 26,000 year cycle of time as the cosmos is, move, is moving in a large circle, a large uh, elliptical circle that everything is moving. And at this time, we're at the doorway, what the Maya would call the, the cross, the Mayan cross is where everything meets. We're at that opening right now. And that doorway is open to all humans. And it's the time when human beings will actualize when everything is possible, when earth and humans will transform. And our DNA will be changed by Hunakpu, which is the name of our new sun. Much of what we thought we knew about the Maya civilization has changed. Uh, using this new technology, uh, over 60,000 new structures have been seen from above using LIDAR. They added that um, at least 1,500 years, uh, the Maya civilization flourished. For 1,500 years, they flourished, and as many as 15 million Maya lived in the area of the Paten, where Tikal is located. Some Maya elders have said all along that the Maya have existed for over 2,000 years and that many of the temples we see now were built on top of other temples that were originally built by the Old Mech, the mother civilization of Mesoamerica, between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. This new information that had been uh, brought into our lives called LIDAR allows an airplane to fly over an area and, and actually shoot uh, shots, video and, and still shots of the jungle and then by using this technology was able to see beyond the trees and see what was really below. And uh, so let's take a look at the area around the, in the Peten around Tikal. This is what it looks like using the LIDAR technology. This is one example. This is another example that's a direct shot from above showing what's below all of the growth of jungle all around Tikal. And, and it is surrounded by jungle. This is what it looked like um, from above. And you can only imagine what it must have been like to be in this civilization, to live near there and be able to go to the market and, and walk around these streets, all of which were white uh, limestone, perfectly straight roads, guiding people into the, the village, into the town, to the market and, and out and so forth to other uh, areas around there. Um, it'll, this photo will be used again to explain what uh, we'll learn a little bit later here. The two books that I have talked about a little is the Book of Mormon and the Dresden Codus. And when I was doing some research on uh, the, the, the actual understanding of how this, this civilization we call to call um really uh what it was actually about what was going on there and and the lifestyles and so forth i stumbled upon this uh photo here of taken by lidar technology as we just saw and was in published in the national geographic magazine and a science person from uh, a member of the latter day saints the people that we call the latter day saints and uh, a reader of the book of mormon was able to use some of the diagrams and some of the measurements of the roads and so forth to collaborate uh, that the Book of Mormon is accurate. And this one discovery, which was actually, um, this story was written uh, February 4th of 2018, it wasn't that long ago, 
that they finally had proof that everything that Joseph Smith uh, had written about in the book uh, of, of Mormon um, really did exemplify that these, this was where the story of Jesus uh, took place. I'm going to get into the 20 glyphs of the of the Chol Key, and the reason why I want to do that is all of this information was found in the Codex of Tikal, and these are the way they draw their glyphs in at that time. Though the artists in the book uh, of the Codex of Tikal, this is what uh, the way they were drawn. Um, I want you to see that because there's a lot of confusion out there right now. Well, for a long time, it's been confusing. What are the glyphs and what do they really look like and how do you pronounce their names and so forth? So I wanted you to see that this was actually what was uh, gathered out of the Kumatsim Wuhun, the Codex of Tikal. The Chol Ki is the name of the sacred calendar of the Ki'iche Maya. And it includes 20 day glyphs and 13 numbers. The 13 plus the 20 equals 33. And when we call out the sacred sounds of the Chol Ki, it connects us back to the sun, to the stars, aligns us to the cycles of earth, opens our heart portal, and actually starts to um, allow our DNA to start rebuilding and so that we can actually start using some of the power that we have within us, including uh, how to breathe uh, using the hummingbird breath, as well as understanding the lightning within our DNA, within our, our blood called Koyapa. The sacred information that's written in the Codex of Tikal is on stele, and it's on the walls of the temples. It's inscribed in the stone so that we would not forget, so that at this time on planet Earth, we would have the opportunity to see what we needed to see at this time. The information was given to us by the beings from the Pleiades, our star ancestors, who remind us of who we are and that is now that now is the time to awaken. And in using the sacred Cholki, we keep our balance and our connection to the planet. The question is, how does this information affect you? What does it have to do with you? What does it have to do with any of us? And the answer that I got when I was with my teachers was that it, it has a very gentle way of helping human beings balance again, balance themselves back to the natural world. And once they understand how they how it feels again to be balanced with the natural world, then they can understand how to move forward into this future that we're talking about. So it teaches us things. And one of the things is to teach us back to how we can uh, get back our intuition and our instincts so that they're working again, instead of uh, listening and trusting and believing everything we hear and, and watch on television or, or read about, we actually start to build our own intuition within ourselves so that we can feel in our hearts what, what needs to be felt. And this is the connection back to the heart that I'm going to be talking more about. It's back to your real self, back to the star self, the, the being that has, is actually capable of connecting to the field, the field that connects all things to all things. And we're going to talk about the possibility of the return of Kukulkan, the feathered serpent back into your hearts. And according to the Mayan people, that's what they were always praying for, was waiting for this return of this love energy to come back into the hearts, not in their hearts, in our hearts. Uh, the Mayan people do sacred ceremonies all the time. And I asked my teacher one day, why did they do ceremonies all the time? And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, it's because they're praying that you human beings in the United States will awaken one of these days so that you'll remember who you are. These are the sacred numbers of the Cholki. Hun, Keb, Oshib, Kayeb, Hob, Wakib, Wukub, Washakib, Beleheb, Lachuch, Hun Lachuch, Keb Lachuch, Osh Lachuch. These 13 numbers or tones are also connected to our bodies in, in ways that it's difficult to understand unless we show you a drawing, and I'm going to do that. But keep in mind that everything in the Chol Ki, in the sacred calendar, is based on our human beings, on the number of days that were in our mother's womb, the 260 days. When you multiply 13 times 20, 
uh, you come up with the uh, 260 days is what we count off every time we do a sacred ceremony. The four parts of the body, the head, thorax, abdomen, and extremities are talked about as the four directions and the four elements. The 13 major joints and the energy hearts, the 20 digits that we have in fingers and toes uh, are also connected even to uh, our, our sacred selves, let's say. Our spinal column, which has 33 vertebrae. And when you add the 13 and the 20, that's what you come up with. And that's what we teach in the breathing process also. And that the human heart is connected to our sun. These are the 13 Ukushmayas that we found in the Codice of Tikal. These are principal centers of energy that's formed by internal forces. In other words, all of this force, all this energy force is within you. So um, what, as you start to do these sacred numbers and tones together around a ceremony, and you do it in a group and you start to harmonize, your entire body starts to feel different because each one of these energy centers is activated. In addition, every time we go through those numbers and we chant, chant the numbers along with the glyphs, we're uh, using those sounds as sound energy to activate uh, those 13 ukush hearts they are referred to as. The, the energies of, of, the, of the numbers is, is something that can't be explained. I mean, you have to experience it. You have to be sitting in a group doing it, sounding out the tones with the other glyphs so that everything starts to resonate as you're sitting around the ceremony. And this is how it's been passed down from generation to generation. These ceremonies of calling out the sounds and the tones that balanced human beings and pacified them emotionally so that their biorhythm and their actual physical body started to relax and you could feel what was really going on inside of us. This is an example of what uh, the Maya predicted would happen whenever we're born on planet Earth. So you saw that burst of light coming from the center of the cosmos. That's a birth. And these are the, the nine glyphs of the day. You have a carrier of the year and an image. And you also have the number of spirits that you live, that you've lived on planet Earth. The most, according to my teachers, is 86 spirits or lives that you live on planet Earth. But these 12 um, beautiful drawings here, they all have a number and a glyph. Uh, correlates to the top line being the first of your the time of your birth to 17 years of age. The second line horizontally is from 18 to 34. And then the third line is from 35 to 52. And then, of course, you have a guide that affects your life and an image that you create as you uh, that you wanted to create when you came here. These are what the meanings of the numbers are. Whom, source, oneness, everything. Kib, duality, polarity. We could get on, we could get into depth on this, but I think we've already gone through this once. So I'm just gonna go through them really quickly here because uh, we actually only have an hour um, and we're already at 30 minutes, it looks like. Uh, Wukub, Washakib, Beleheb, Lachuch, Hun Lachuch, Kablachuch, Oshlachuch, 13. And notice on 13, it's a completion, ascension, the magical power to transform, transition, transmutation when everything is possible. This number is a very powerful number according to what the Maya have been passing down generation to generation. And that's where we are right now. We are in the time of Oshlachuch. The Cholki is, again, the, the tones, but it's also the 20 glyphs, the 20 digits of the human body and the 20 Uchugas Mayas of the human body. And these are the Uchuga Mayas. These are the spiritual points that convert force into dynamism. These areas are points which tone and pacify the integrity of every organism. So again, as we're sitting around a fire ceremony counting uh, the number and also sounding the day tone, uh, the day glyph, 
uh, all of this is happening within our body. And this is where uh, our, our glyphs are actually, uh, the, the, our body, for example, is connected to these glyphs. And if you'll notice this Akpu symbol, that's the sun is connected to the heart. So we could spend a lot of time talking about the Chol Kih and all of this information, and, and we probably will uh, in future classes. But I wanna just say that uh, more importantly, what we need to get into is this uh, understanding that we are um, capable of, of so much. However, if we spend time dealing with what we call the 23 enemies, it's difficult to move beyond where we are as human beings. And the 23 enemies are, of course, they include fear, greed, hate, envy, judgment, all of the things that bring us down. And these are the things we have to overcome in order for us to move into the future. This is the first uh, glyph usually starts off with bots because uh, eight bots or washa keep bots is the first day of the Mayan calendar, the, the sacred calendar of the 260 days. You can see the, the beauty that's in this glyph and it's, it was talking about the heart of space, the thread of time. And uh, it, the Nawal, every glyph has a Nawal, kind of like a daemon, if you will. Uh, it's it's a, a monkey, in this case, the monkey spirit that lives within me because I'm bots and uh, the energy that's in my left arm. And it's the element of earth. This is a. Eh. It's a uh, mountain lion energy, but it's the spiritual path. It's also the staircase to heaven and earth, between heaven and earth. It's our destiny, memories of past lives. Ah, the sacred bundle, uh, our authority as human beings that we that a lot of us give up to others, but we have to take it back now and, and walk with our heads held high again. It's the upper and lower worlds and the symbol of power. The Nawal is um, armadillo. Ish. The spiritual woman, the jaguar, the mother earth, individual conscious, conscience, strength, and intelligence. It's the energy of the jaguar, or the jaguar, and the body region is the left foot. Tzikin, flight, visions, messengers, happiness, communication between man and creator. The eagle and the condor and the quetzal are all examples of the nawal of Tzikin. Akmak, forgiveness and knowledge, ancestral wisdom, the elders, planetary consciousness, and community. Noch, the wisdom of humankind, our brains, our intelligence, memory, the movement of space and earth, and synchronicities. Coyote is the Nawal of Noch. It means knowledge. Tihash, the knife, the magic, the magician, the liberation, health, obsidian, the sacred offering and the magic knife. Uh, Tihash is that beautiful obsidian blade that I have here on my altar that I uh, also use a, a black obsidian, a rainbow obsidian sphere to do healing on people when they have headaches and they have muscle aches and so forth. But it's also for me to heal myself. Kawak. Gawak is the family, it's the disciples, our calendar, gestalt, which is the things that exist in your experience of this life, that's your gestalt, and that's kawak. So the Maya were aware of all of this information, the realization and the end of a cycle, and the turtle is the nawal. Hunakpu, some say, some pronounce it ahau, it's our son. The sun, our, our hunter, it means the hunter, which is the blowgun. And the, you notice that a uh, how or a poo has a little a mouth that looks like he's getting ready to blow something. Well, that's our sun that actually can blow out uh, the darts that come out into space towards Earth sometimes called so, uh, what we would call uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares. It's also uh, the creator. And... The Nawal, now listen to this, the Nawal of Apu or Ahau are human beings with wings. Now that kind of reminds of what I said earlier about how we have to remember that we can become the butterfly. And the body region, of course, is the heart, 
our soul. Emosh, invisible side of the universe, our com the comets, craziness. We've had a lot of comets this year, I, I've noticed, and I really love watching them and seeing them in the sky. It's just quite amazing to see these things coming from other parts of the universe passing through our solar system. Um, it also means creativity. It's the antenna so that we can receive information, and it's the fountain of life. The Nawal of Imosh is the shark and the alligator. Eek, the breath, the wind, the oxygen, uh, the spiritual breath, what I call the hummingbird breath. And it's the cleaning and purification of humankind, human beings. It's also the using of learning to use quartz crystals. Akabal, it's the twilight, the time just before darkness and just before dawn, the place of mystery. And it's also hope. And I have a suspicion that right now, many of us are in this time of Akabal where we, we know light exists and we know there's going to be a dawn and now we've got hope. I would say that uh, this is a really important glyph right now at this time because it's understanding that we're in a time of darkness and we've been in the time of darkness for quite a long time. Um, 5,200 years, I, I think, is the number I was quoted. Now we're getting ready to, op to come out of the time of darkness back into the time of light. The Nawal of Akabal is the bat and also the Makkah. It is our third eye. Cut, the spider's web, the net, the traps and tests of life, growth, catching what you want. It's the spider as the Nawal on the little lizard. Khan, the serpent energy, our sexual energy, uh, the return of Kukul Khan, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, evolution, the spiral of our DNA, wisdom of the ancients, and uh, Koyopa, the inner lightning of fire. The Nawal of Khan is the serpent. Kameh, the change of the spiritual state, the movement from uh, what we think of as life into death, but only in the stage that we see here when some people choose to leave. It's actually called transformation. It's the dimensional door. It really is the beginning and the end and the, and the rebirth or the rebeginning. And that's kind of what's happening right now on our planet. Many, many things are passing through this period of time of our transformation where we actually are remembering that there is no death. There's only transformation. And the Nawal of Kameh is the owl. Kieh, it's the four elements, the four colors of human beings that are on the planet right now. The white, red, yellow, black, and the mixture of all of those colors together. And it's the four directions, balance, harmony, and physical existence. And the Nawal is the deer. Kanil, the seed, life, realization, knowledge, Venus. So there's so much information that's in each one of these glyphs. And Kanil is the, the Nawal of Kanil is the rabbit, the bunny. Uh, and it also represents the planting of seeds, germination, and creativity. Toch, payment, work, justice, karma, dharma the strength of will, the spirit of the heart of space, divine master. And the Nawal of, Doh, of Toch is the Puma, mountain lion. C, spiritual law, fire, obsidian, fidelity, order, emotional life, exactness. And the sacred wolf is the Nawal. And I have a story I could tell you. It's in my book about how this Nawal energy uh, changed my life when I met a white wolf in a town called Chimayo, but the original name of that town was Simayo. Simayo, and it's the sacred place where people would come from all over the world to gather sacred dirt so they could take it back to their uh, homes and use it for healing and cleansing. True story. So here we are living on planet Earth during the time of the 13th Baktun. And uh, last December, December 2019, something happened on our planet that changed a lot of our lives, probably most of our lives, if not everybody's life, unless they have no connection and they live in the jungle and they're completely off of 
uh, out of and don't have phones and don't have the internet and so forth. Um, our lives were changed no matter where we lived. When everything began to change on our planet in regard to how we live with each other, and we can't deny it, it has had an effect. Now, most of us know and, and will admit, if we're honest, that it wasn't working very well before this, this event occurred, that billions of people were hungry, billions of people were struggling with survival and living on planet Earth. So a lot of people will say, well, I can hardly wait for COVID-19 to leave so we can get back to normal. Well, I would say uh, it isn't a good idea for us to have a plan to go back to normal because we're, we're not... Uh, we're not capable of, of going back there uh, because we've awakened. We've seen what it's like to be uh, feeling again, to recognize that something changed, but we're okay. And now we have to choose new ways of being uh, in our world, which gets me back to where do we go from here? This is the question that people were asking at the time that Tikal was collapsing, when everything that they thought was going to be that way forever changed. Uh, I'm sure their lives changed. I'm sure everything they thought about, everything they, they lived for, it all changed. Same thing's happening in a lot of places on planet Earth right now. So I want to talk about the teachings of Christ. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, a lot of this information just came, uh, was made, made available recently. And I stumbled upon the Book of Mormon um, and the teachings of Jesus and then remembered that I had been a student of the Urantia book for years. And I'm going to apply all of this information very quickly here. Um, according to the Book of Mormon, Jesus lived amongst the people of Zarahemla after his resurrection. I'm not sure that's spelled correctly, but hopefully resurrection is. Uh, once Christ uh, decided to walk amongst the living again in his Urantia form, uh, he decided he wanted to go off and visit other places rather than hang out in uh, in the area that he was born in. And uh, so this concept that uh, the Book of Mormon is saying that Jesus was living amongst these people that he that Joseph Smith calls Zarahemla or that Moroni, the angel that came to Joseph, uh, gave him this information through these tablets, these gold tablets and that the people of Zarahemla uh, were his students for a while. Can you imagine uh, to have this being come in the Marantia farm and stand and teach you? I, I, it would be like something that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? And it's what happened there, apparently. Now, because of the recent use of LIDAR technology and National Geographic magazine in 2018, and also according to the Keys of Enoch, written by J.J. Hertak, Tikal, is Zarahemla. And let's get into it. This is a, a page that I copied out of the Keys of Enoch written by JJ. And it talks about the head of the dove being in an area that we refer to now as Mesoamerica. Uh, and that these pyramids that were built by these beings that came from the Pleiades and from the Ryan's Belt and other places in space to come to this planet to prepare it for the future. And Tikal is one of the sacred sites that was constructed. And this information I read years ago, I knew he called it Zarahemla, but I didn't realize that it was also referred to that name uh, in the Book of Mormon. And so this has been a lot of awakening for me also. This is supposed to be where, according to um, Enoch, the angel that came to J.J. Hertak and gave him all this information. This is the area where something very magical is going to start happening, where human beings are going to be starting to remember a lot of information very quickly. But that's not the only place. Actually, in that book, it also says there are 12 places in the world where the Brotherhood of Light will return for the reprogramming of human beings. And one of those places is an area from Pueblo, Colorado, south to the Mescalero Apache Reservation, just south of Albuquerque, New Mexico. That means that here we are talking about uh, the Rawlings Library is actually in this area. Okay. Isn't that exciting? I think it is. 
I think it's wonderful that we're in this area called uh, one of the um, uh, parts, the hearts of the dove that uh, is referred to in the Keys of Enoch. The other thing that's interesting is that in science and religion, in the Meridian magazine, they're referring to science and religion. Uh, this photo that was taken by National Geographic gave the, scienti the scientific aspect of proof to many of the teachers of the Book of Mormon that this was is, according to all the dimensions, what was described uh, by the golden tablets that Joseph Smith wrote about uh, in his book, The Book of Mormon. I pulled these photos out to show you that these photos of Christ living or being a teacher there in Tikal. You can see the temples way in the distance. You can see the temple of the sun and the temple of the jaguar. And it says, and now behold, these are the words which ye shall say. And he refers to these people as the Nephites, Joseph Smith does, and that the Nephites were the people that lived in Tikal. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. Why is that statement so important? The, that the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of people. Now we're getting into what I have said and others like me have said. And my teacher Eileen talks about all the time that the kingdom of heaven is within. Well, Christ was saying the same thing when he walked um, around in uh, the Middle East. Uh, he walked around where, in the, where he lived. It doesn't matter what we call it now. And he talked about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, this is an example of what it says in the Book of Mormon, uh, that the Nephites will meet a tragic ending, that over time the people lose faith and war breaks out, even after years and years and years of, of no war, and that they're wiped out and the Lamanites who survived are among the ancestors of the American Indians. Introduction to the Book of Mormon. When Christ was walking around in his physical body, he did his best to try to teach the human beings around him that they are amazing beings, just like him, that all he did, that he could do, we can do, and more, apparently, and that the kingdom of heaven is within. And I, I think one of the things that's hard for a lot, a lot of us to understand is when we use the word kingdom, what does that word really mean? And I, I guess I would like to use the word realm, the realm of heaven the realm of peace and joy and comfort and understanding and forgiveness, all of those things that we would say would go along with experiencing what it would be like to be in heaven um, are within you. The realm of heaven is within you. And according to what I've read many times in the Urantia book, Christ did his best to try and teach the human beings around him how amazing they are and how they could do all of these amazing things. And yet, um, apparently, he felt like he had failed in teaching them that because when he left, many, many of them uh, still didn't get it. I pulled this from the Arantia book uh, today. And I, if you don't mind, I'd just like to read it to you. By teaching that the kingdom is within, by exalting the individual, Jesus struck the death blow of the old society in that he ushered in the new dispensation of true social righteousness. This new order of society, the world has little known because it has refused to practice the principles of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And when the king, this kingdom of spiritual preeminence does come upon the earth, it will not be manifested in mere improved social and material conditions, but rather in the glories of those enhanced and enriched spiritual values, which are characteristic of the approaching age of improved human relations and advancing spiritual attainments. Now, many elders in, in uh, the studies that I've done uh, have talked about the system, the matrix, let's say, uh, would be breaking down. And, and yes, we've all been co-creators in it. We've all been uh, uh, complicit, let's say, in, in a lot of things that go on in our matrix. 
Uh, but it's all breaking down. And now we're realizing that we haven't been taking care of our Mother Earth. We've been sleeping and we've forgotten our connection to the cosmos. And planet Earth is going to shift. It's time to awaken and to prepare for this shift. I, I want to say that on Sunday, I did have a chance to see a little bit of Sunday morning on CBS. And they interviewed two women who's, uh, they live in Franklin, Indiana. And their children were very ill with cancer. And one of them had passed away. And they started finding out that many of the children in that town are suffering from some sort of cancer that was actually uh, because their water is polluted by two chemical companies that were manufacturing one, a cleaning uh, a substance used for cleaning, uh, dry cleaning clothes, and another company, I won't get into the names of the companies, but it only goes to show you that the same thing that happened in Tikal with the drinking water being polluted is happening in many, many cities throughout our country and in many places all over the planet. Now, according to the Ki'iche teachings, this time is a new beginning because we have a new sun and our new sun will activate our DNA and reopen our portal to the cosmos. And our portal to the cosmos is your heart. The Maya portal to the cosmos, your place in the universe, in the universe is open after 26,000 years and your heart is the doorway. All human beings are prepared for the future. And everything we need, everything you need, is already within you. You just have to remember who you are. You are a universal being, acclimating and adapting to your grace as a universal being. It's said that our minds and our DNA are being activated by our sun. And each, as, as this occurs, each of us uh, must begin to use more of our brain and more of our mind power. And I would say more of our heart power. And we need to practice remembering how to use our natural abilities to benefit all, not just ourselves. Feelings. Wow. I, I can tell you that I know very few people who actually uh, used to feel very much. They pretended they didn't feel much. They, it was kind of like to stay numb was the goal. Now, um, we are beginning to feel again. Things are happening around us that we can't uh, dismiss. We have to pay attention. And these feelings are normal. And we have to start trusting our feelings. And we have to also question everything that doesn't feel right. Every time you hear a lie, you'll feel it in your body. You'll feel it in your heart. It'll Something your little dog will bark inside of you saying, that was a lie. And we have to start questioning what we've been programmed to believe. We have to prepare ourselves for this major shift that our planet is going through. Uh, first, remember who you are. Remember the power of your words and your thoughts. Every word you, th you say and every thought you think has an effect on everything in the field. The field is connects, it connects all to all. Be clear and honest and speak your truth. And talk out loud to yourselves. Honestly, this activates something within you. You can sit down in a chair and you can talk about the problems that you're having, the things that you're experiencing, the things you're watching. Be, be honest, be truthful, and be clear. And as you do that, your endocrine system starts to produce uh, DMT, actually. And you begin to open up the gate, the gate that we call Koyupa, which is the lightning within your blood. And in every situation, learn to choose love and let go of the fear. Let go of all the 23 enemies, the judgment, the envy, all of those things. Choose love. And this is your connection to the field that connects all to all. At this time, I'd just like to say that it's really important for us to follow some of the teachings of our indigenous people here in the Americas, up in North America. And it's about reconnecting back to the mother, reconnecting back to our mother earth and to the feminine energy within each of us and start respecting that connection again. And in a way that we have to rise to a higher level in order to heal and forgive and also to start doing our share to keep the planet clean, keep the water clean and move to a higher level of consciousness 
so that we can start to feel our resonance with the earth and to feel our balance with the mother. The mother has been abandoned for a long time, especially in this country we live in here. It's time for us to remember, like the indigenous people do remember, they remember that our mother is the goal. To connect with her is the goal and that our mother is there for us and we must be there for her. The elders uh, that I studied with uh, would take me around from village to village uh, as we traveled around Guatemala. And, and they would talk about the um, meaning of, of the three hearthstones that are in all of the uh, Mayan villages where people would cook their food every day. And I wanna pass this on to you because I think it's important. This would be a typical uh, area that a Mayan woman, a Mayan family would be cooking in. But you notice the uh, pan in the back where she's making the tortillas, the maize. And you can see the corn that hasn't been ground up yet. So she'll have a grinding stone and then she'll have a place where she can flatten out the, my, the masa. And then she puts the tortillas on the, the hot plate in the back. Now under that hot plate are three stones. And those three stones represent something really important because in the middle of those three stones is of course the fire that heats the platter the, that, that cooks. This is what it's connected to, Orion, the stars in our sky. This is Orion, and you can see the three stars that make up the Orion's belt and the two stars that make up the feet. But in the middle of that is the fire, is the nebula of Orion. And this is what it looks like through uh, the new telescopes that we have available to us. Again, Orion Nebula. Now, for thousands of years, 2,000 to maybe 5,000, maybe 6,000, these people we call Maya or Olmec or Toltec or uh, it doesn't matter what the names are. They were all human beings living in Mesoamerica, knew about this, this beautiful system that's in the middle of, of this Orion area they called, uh, that we call the Nebula. And it's where the stars are born and it's where we go back and forth. When we leave this planet, we go back through there. And when we come to this planet, we come from there. And this is the great remembering that the elders have talked about. The elders of indigenous people on the planet, they are our ancestors. They came from the stars. They gave us much information about our cosmos, our planet, our solar system. And they taught us a great deal about how we would awaken one day from this sleep that we've been in now. Uh, they left us information on the stones and they told us stories through ceremonies. And over and over and over, they kept saying, uh, you are a human being. They say that we were made from corn by these four beings and that the four colors of corn are the four colors of human beings that walk the earth at this time. And it's the time for us to remember. Now, the return of Gukumats, uh, Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, this has been talked about many, many times by many, many people. The return of the feathered serpent back into Mesoamerica. Now is the time when that was expected to happen. I feel like it is happened. It's, it's already happened and it's happening within each of us once we start choosing love instead of fear. That's what I really wanted to talk about this evening. And I hope that I haven't uh, confused anyone with all this information because it is a lot of information. Um, Charlene, can you connect me back to, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, you have an opportunity to ask questions if you want by connecting to the uh, YouTube there. And I think, I'm not sure how it works, but just uh, if you have a question, please send it to us. And I'll do my best to try and, and answer uh, any questions that you may have. Um, I'm excited about where we are as human beings right now. I'm convinced that we all came here with a purpose. We all chose to be here on planet Earth at this time. And here we are. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to keep giving our power away? Are we going to keep... Uh, blaming the system 
for our discomforts, for our dis-ease, for our feelings of disenfranchisement. I mean, basically, the the humankind that I uh, love and appreciate so much is that we are all here together. Now let's support one another. Let's lift each other up. Let's carry one another. When someone falls, pick them up and carry them. It's happening. COVID is, is reminding us of who we are in a very painful thing to watch. And yet, maybe that's what it takes. It sometimes takes uh, an earth-shaking experience to awaken us from the sleep that we've been uh, experiencing, the slumbering. Uh, and when we awaken to who we really are, we begin to see that there is so much beauty on this planet. There are so many talented, intelligent, creative beings walking around us that are capable of making fantastic music, art that we can't even uh, express the beauty of. Uh, and our hearts are starting to open. And as they start to open, we start to feel. And as we start to feel, we recognize that we are so much more than we've been conditioned to believe that we are. And I encourage us all to stand, stand tall, walk and be proud and start doing the things that you would like your children to start learning from you. Be the example. Watch what you say because your words are powerful. Watch what you think because your thoughts are just as powerful. And recognize that your heart is resonating now, that it's open. And when your heart opens, then you're capable of doing so much. And I encourage us human beings now to uh, rise to our highest level. And I'm going to conclude this talk by taking you back to uh, the story of Tikal. When the community started to collapse, when some went north, some went south, the ones that went south created Palenque. The ones that went north created one of the seven wonders of the world, Chichen, and later became known as Chichen Itza because the Itza came in later than the Maya, after the Maya left. The, one of the most advanced uh, places in the world. You stand at the bottom of the pyramid of, of uh, Kukulkan and you clap your hands and you can hear the rattle of the rattles uh, of the snake. And if you walk to the other side and you clap, you can hear the Quetzal bird calling in the distance. That's how intelligent these people were, or maybe are. Maybe we are they. We are the ones that were doing that at that time. And now it's time for us to remember because we keep looping. We keep coming back and living lives here on planet Earth. And I'd like to thank you all for being here and listening to what I've had to say tonight. And I look forward to continuing more of these kinds of talks. And, and, and let's get together and talk uh, in person as soon as uh, everyone starts to relax and remember who is really uh, running this thing. You are. Thank you, Eduardo. That was fascinating. Um, you give us uh, hope and inspiration, and you're so knowledgeable about all of this. Uh, that's why we keep inviting you back by popular demand. <laughs> so let's hope that we have more of these presentations. And I just wanted to mention the book again, Yashel. And um, in each chapter, you know, you, you have, I don't know if you can see it, but you have you know, the, the tones and the explanation, they're really neat. Tell us a little bit about the book and where people can get it. I get calls every time after you finish your presentation. Where can we get the book? Okay. Uh, you can order the book now by going to my website at innercosmicdoorway.com. And uh, we'll add it to the description of the show at the bottom I guess if I was really good at marketing, which I used to be good at, now I'm I'm waking up, so I'm not good at that kind of thing anymore. I'm good at helping you wake up. Um, I feel like it's uh, an important book, and I've had a lot of feedback from people who've read it. Um, 
positive feedback about the fact that uh, it's about a human, it's a story, it's a, it's a fictional story, and yet it's filled with real information that um, is, is available for us to, to learn from. And um, each chapter, the first 20 chapters have a glyph and, this, and they're a title of the glyph and an explanation of what the glyph means. But if you can go to my website, innercosmicdoorway.com, uh, or you can email me at e griego, G R I E G O, at me, M E dot com. And I'll, I'll be glad to get in touch with you, and you can order the book directly from me. You are still good at marketing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't do have three. I don't have questions, but I have three comments from Patsy Kate Booth. She says, Eduardo, thank you. Beautiful presentation. Angelina Perez says, hi, thank you, with a smiley face. And uh, there's another message that says, Lorraine says, thank you so much. So <laughs> Nice. nice. I'll, add, I'll, add, uh, I'll add my thanks um, to that. And uh, like I said, I hope that we'll uh, bring you back again soon. Okay. Any, any closing comments? Yes. Rejoice, for you are all amazing light beings, and we are all here together. So if anything comes up that frightens you, stop and breathe and say, I am here, and I choose love. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is my last virtual program for this year. But starting January, uh, please um, look at our website and uh, check out all the things that we are doing. And Eduardo, we'll talk soon. And uh, like I said, I hope that we can bring you back um, early next year. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. And, uh, and thank you again for joining us.